Before the Fact by Francis Isles Read by Bruce Montague Chapter 1 Some women give birth to murderers. Some go to bed with them, and some marry them. Lena Aysgarth had lived with her husband for nearly eight years before she realised that she was married to a murderer. Suspicion is a tenuous thing, so impalpable that the exact moment of its birth is not easy to determine. But looking back over the series of little pictures which composed the memory of her married life, Lena found later that certain of them, a small incident here, its significance quite unnoticed at the time, an unimportant action there, perhaps just a chance word of her husband's, had become illuminated by her fear so that they stood out like a row of street lamps along a dark straight road, a road which looked so easy in the daytime, but so sinister by night. Even her very first meeting with Johnny seemed, in this later illumination, a red triangle of danger, whose warning she had deliberately ignored. It had been at a picnic, got up by the Cutherston girls. The Cutherston girls were always getting up picnics and asking the participants to bring friends. A fatal thing to do, for the friends of our friends are often so very unexpected. Lena MacLaidlaw lived then in Abbot Monkford, which is a small hamlet in Dorsetshire, seven miles from the nearest railway station, so that even the picnic got up by the Cutherston girls was an event. The objective of the picnic was a well-known beauty spot in the neighbourhood containing a view. Lena, who had seen the view a hundred times already, went because there was a chance of meeting strangers. She often felt that in the country the only thing worth living for was strangers. On this particular picnic there was only one stranger. My dear, Lena said to the elder Cutherston girl under cover of The View, who is that rather attractive man with the Bernards? Very attractive man, corrected the elder Cutherston girl with enthusiasm. Isn't he simply divine? It's Johnny Aysgarth. You know, he's a cousin of the Middlehams. I know. Lena looked at the young man with increased interest. So that was Johnny Aysgarth. You've heard about the Aysgarths said the elder Cutherston girl disappointedly. Of course, Lena nodded. Naturally, she had heard about the Aysgarths. Everyone who knew the Middlehams had heard about the Aysgarths. Sir Thomas Aysgarth was Lord Middlehams' first cousin. Lord Middleham had somehow managed to retain his estates, unlike most of his brother peers, and even enough money to keep them up. Sir Thomas Aysgarth had not. He now lived partly in an upper masonate in Hampstead, and partly with such of his relations and old friends as he could induce to invite him for long visits. Of his four sons, one had been killed in the war, one was in Australia, nominally sheep farming, one was on the stage, and Johnny, the youngest, was... Well, no one quite knew what Johnny was. But when the Aysgarth name was mentioned at all, Johnny invariably came into the conversation at once. "'He's staying at Penn's Hayes, Miss Cutherston volunteered. Lord Middleham at Penn's Hayes still ruled Abbot Monkford and its attendant hamlets of Abbot Tarantington and Abbot Blansford as firmly in fact, if not in theory, as his feudal ancestors had done five hundred years ago. But what's he doing with the Bernards? Lena wanted to know. Miss Cutherston shrugged her shoulders. I should put it, what are the Bernards doing with him? And that's pretty obvious, isn't it? I don't want to be catty, but Jessie and Alice are getting on, aren't they? And the Bernards have got money, and the Aysgarths haven't. I should say it's quite obvious. Poor man, Lena laughed. If he's booked for Jessie or Alice. How old is he? I don't know. But no doubt the Bernards could tell you if you're interested. Interested, said Lena. But she was interested. She was interested to know if Johnny Aysgarth was as fascinating as he was supposed to be. 
She was interested to know if he was as attractive as he looked. She was interested to know why all the women who knew him spoke his name in tones of mingled rapture and guardedness. She was interested to know whether he was really just another of the horsey, doggy, shooting, fishing, hunting nincompoops with which her path seemed to be strewn, or whether for once something a little more civilised had come out of Penn's haze. She was interested to know whether he resented the Barnard girls calling him Johnny already. She was interested to know whether he was interested in one of the Barnard girls. In fact, Lena told herself, Johnny Aysgarth was a stranger, and she was therefore automatically interested in him. At any rate, his manners are charming, she thought, covertly watching him, and her interest grew. It was gratified. Before they had settled down for lunch, Mrs. Bernard, an obviously reluctant Mrs. Bernard, Lena saw with hidden amusement, appeared at her side, Mr. Aysgarth in tow. Oh, Lena, dear, may I introduce uh, Mr. Aysgarth, Miss McLeadlaw. Uh, Mr. Aysgarth is staying at Penshays. Oh, yes, Lena said brightly. You know the Midlands, then, Mr. Aysgarth. What a ridiculous thing to say, she thought. Of course he knows the Midlands if he's staying there, and of course he knows perfectly well that I know he's a cousin. Johnny Aysgarth was still holding her hand in its pigskin gauntlet. Yes, he smiled. I know the Midlands. In fact, Charlie Midlands, some sort of a cousin of mine. But they evidently don't know me, or I shouldn't be staying there. Now where, said Mrs. Bernard, and wandered distrustfully away. Johnny Aysgarth was still smiling at Lena. It was an infectious, intimate smile, which seemed to imply that out of all the people there, only they two really had the right to smile at each other. And his eyes did twinkle. Lena smiled back. He was fascinating. She withdrew her hand. Nobody had ever retained it so long on an introduction before. She saw now that Johnny was shorter than she had thought, not more than five foot eight at most, but his chest was broad, and he was evidently well-muscled and athletic. His hair was very dark, with little tight curls over the temples, and his eyes a light grey. Lena thought his face the merriest she had ever seen. "'I had an awful job to get the old girl to introduce me to you,' he said. "'She didn't want to one little bit.' "'Oh?' said Lena, a little taken aback. "'Why?' she added feebly. Johnny laughed. "'Oh, she's got me booked in her mind for one of her comic daughters, of course.' he said, without self-consciousness. She didn't want me to meet the opposition. If Johnny Aysgarth was not self-conscious, Lena was. Opposition, she said, as frigidly as she could. Local opposition, he replied with another smile. Who'd look at the Bernards when you're on the same picnic? Lena felt herself colouring and was correspondingly annoyed. She was not used to these direct methods. This Johnny Aysgarth needed putting in his place. What, she said as deliberately as she could, do you think of our view, Mr. Aysgarth? It was a question she had thought out the moment she saw Johnny at her side. It was to be said with a little smile, which would convey that this was the stereotyped question that every other girl in the county would put to him in similar circumstances, and that he was going to be judged on his answer to it. If he had any intelligence, he would interpret the smile rightly. If not... But she now forgot to smile. "'Damn the view,' replied Mr. Aysgarth simply. "'It's you I want to look at, not the view.' Lena's colour deepened. Then she laughed.
It was really impossible to take the man seriously. What idiots other women were! She realised suddenly of what Johnny's expression had reminded her. It was that of a small boy participating in some joyful, small boyish crime, smiling at his accomplice. He must be met on his own ground. If you're trying to tell me I'm pretty, I'm afraid you're wasting your time. I've had it far too well rubbed into me by my family that I'm nothing of the sort. Ask Mrs. Bernard if you want an unprejudiced opinion. Johnny Aysgarth's eyes began to twinkle again. Ah, oh, Mrs. Bernard said something quite different about you. What? That you were clever. Lena made a grimace. Anybody would be clever by the Bernard standard. So, you see, I thought if you were clever, you'd like to be told you were pretty. Whereas, of course, if you'd only been pretty, I should have told you you were clever. Oh, Lena laughed. Those are your methods, are they? But why bother to tell me anything at all? Johnny suddenly looked serious. Because I decided... As soon as I saw you, that you were the only person in this outfit worth talking to for more than two minutes at a time. Had you? Lena said feebly. Aysgarth's sudden earnestness had again robbed her of confidence. Yes, he said with conviction. And aren't you? Of course, you know perfectly well you are. He smiled at her once more, the same intimate, knowledgeable smile. But this time it made Lena uneasy. She thought, He looks as if he knows me down to the most secret detail. And I believe he does. She felt stripped. Johnny hardly left her side for the rest of the afternoon. Lena went up to her bedroom in a temper of resentment. She had been cold, she had been actually rude, but she had been unable to shake Johnny off until they reached her own front door. She had refused to ask him in. She pulled off her hat and stared at her face in the mirror. Her cheeks were still flushed with annoyance. She was angry that at first she had enjoyed Johnny's company. She was angry at the realisation that for a moment she had really believed that he did think her pretty, and at the pleasure the belief had given her. She had known that she was looking her best when Mrs. Bernard brought him up to her. The wind had whipped some colour into her usually rather pale cheeks, and the cocky little blue hat, which exactly matched her eyes, dipping its brim over one and lifting over the other, was the prettiest she had. She had been delighted that someone found her good to look at, and he had just been playing with her experimenting, as he apparently did with every woman or girl he met, saying the things he thought she would like to hear, with his tongue in his cheek and a mocking twinkle in his eye, that all the others were too foolish to read. But she had read it, and very bitterly she now resented it. She began to change for dinner, trying to reason herself into calm. She was twenty-eight, she reminded herself, not eighteen. What on earth did it matter that a man should have tried on her the hackneyed methods which appeared to be successful with others and had failed? Nothing. But it was annoying for all that. He should have had the intelligence to realise that she was not the same as other women. Her nervous exasperation grew. Johnny Aysgarth was intolerable. Women had told him for so long that he was irresistible that he believed it. He took it for granted. He traded on it. He considered it made him fascinating to say things which anyone else would not say, to walk up to a girl and talk to her as if he had known her all his life. Did other women really fall for such crude methods? Lena felt herself a Pharisee among her own sex. It's you I want to look at, not the view. Insufferable. I decided as soon as I saw you that you were the only person here... No! In this outfit worth talking to. 
As she dressed, Lena went over and over the conversation. It was perfectly clear to her now. What a fool she had been to have been taken in at the time. At first he had called her pretty because he thought she would like that. Then he had shifted his attack and said she was interesting to talk to. And that really had got home. Right until after lunch she had been taken in by that. Interesting to... She could picture Johnny recounting the scene to a friend. She did picture it. Ah, oh, they've all got their weakness. I made a bit of a false start, but I soon got round that. I just let her think she was interesting. That's the line, my boy. If they're not pretty, they always think they're interesting. Good Lord, they'll believe anything you tell them in that line and love you for it. She pictured, too, what the Bernards must have said to him. Oh, Lena MacLaidlaw, she's terribly clever. We're all terrified of her. Her sister married Cecil Whitten, you know. Yes, the author. Lena often goes to stay there. She knows all sorts of writers and people. We always feel terribly out of it when she talks about Wells and Edgar Wallace and all those clever people. She's far too clever for us. In the country... It is the worst social misdemeanor to be clever. And Johnny had said, You watch. She'll be flirting with me before tea time. He had probably made a bet on it. Hadn't someone once told her that Johnny Aysgarth was always ready to make a bet about anything? Lena pulled her second stocking off with a tug that was positively vicious. Well, if he had made a bet on it, he had lost. She had not flirted with him, and he had not had the sense to see that she was not of the kind that likes flirting, that she detested the idea of flirting, that she never had flirted in her life. He was just a fool, like the rest of the young men. Rather a different kind of fool, perhaps, but a fool all the same. Well, what did it matter? He was going to marry one of the rich Barnards. Good luck to him. And her. She would probably never see him again. She did not see him for so long that she began seriously to fear that she really never would see him again. As she had reminded herself, Lena... herself, Lena was twenty-eight. As she found out, among other things, during the next few days, Johnny Aysgarth was twenty-seven. She had said nothing less than the truth when she told him that she knew she was not pretty. She did know it. Her family had informed her of that fact so often and so earnestly that not even the toughest doubt could remain with her. To underline it, they not infrequently called her letterbox in pleasant allusion to her mouth. Lena's younger sister, Joyce, was the pretty one. That had been rubbed into both girls from a very early age. There were no brothers. Joyce, rather against her father's wish, had married an author who was also a dilettante, or a dilettante who was also an author. At any rate, he had plenty of money of his own, besides what Joyce would bring him. Since marrying Joyce, he had become quite famous, whether as a result of Joyce's prettiness or not. Joyce and he lived in London, in a big house in Hampstead, 
and Lena envied her sister wholeheartedly. No, my dear, had been the burden of Mrs. MacLaidlaw's observations to her elder daughter ever since the latter was out of her teens. No, Joyce has got the looks, and one can't expect two pretty ones in the same family. You've got nothing but your hair and your eyelashes, so you'll just have to rely on your brains. Mrs. MacLaidlaw belonged to the era when a girl's assets were reckoned entirely in terms of husband-catching. Lena had always known that she was supposed to be intelligent. At eighteen she had been extremely pleased with herself about it. She had joined feminist movements, taken them, as well as herself, very seriously, read a great many pamphlets, and even written some, and despised her family and her neighbours in by no means a quiet way. She had despised mere prettiness, too. She had despised men. She had despised most things, except Lena MacLaidlaw. By twenty-eight, her views had very much changed. Bored at home, longing for escape, and yet never quite able to take the drastic step of leaving it on her own initiative, she had found that her values had been, for a woman, mistaken ones. Her mother's firm ideas about feminine objectives, and still more, her family's outspoken comments, had had their effect. Lena, always impressionable, arrived at the other extreme. She came quite imperceptibly to despise her mind, which was very much above the feminine average, and embraced the idea that the only thing worth having for a woman was looks. Not being pretty, she was, therefore, as a woman, a failure. Indeed, not only did she now despise her brains, she often wished heartily that she had none. Intelligence, she had very soon discovered, was, in her set, the thing above all others which was not done. In a woman it amounted to the unforgivable crime. Kleptomania could always be excused. Intelligence, never. The rumour of her unfortunate brains frightened the young men away from Lena as effectually as if she had scared them off with a police rattle. The only times she had ever felt glad that she was not a complete fool were on her short and very occasional visits to Joyce, whose circle held to a table of values very different from that prevailing in Abbot Monkford. But she disliked Joyce's literary young men so heartily that she might just as well have stayed at home. These families. What her family had never troubled to tell Lena was that her face, if not conventionally pretty, was a hauntingly attractive one. Among our friends, even among our loves, there are very few faces which we can recreate before the eye of the mind in their fleshy absence. Lena's was one of these. It was a very small face with, except for her mouth, small features. An elfish, puckish little face, which is rare among fair women. Her hair, which even her mother had admitted to be a good point, was a pale, silvered gold, and her eyes a vivid blue with very long lashes curling up at the tip. Her mouth was very red, and was only thrown into prominence by the miniature effect of her other features. Her upper lip was short, and her chin very delicate and narrow, though only just holding its own against recession. She was not tall, and her undiluted Scottish ancestry had ensured that her bones, while fine, should be definite. It would have been an exaggeration to call her figure sturdy, but it was certainly not slight. Her hands were very small and very soft. She did not care for games and was no good at them, but she could walk most men off their feet. She came of a family of soldiers. Her father was the first MacLaidlaw, for heaven knew how many generations, who had failed to produce a son for the army. Though a genial man, there were times when General MacLaidlaw looked gloomily upon his two daughters. Lena knew and quite understood. She was no more of a snob than was good for her, but she was naively glad that she was descended in the direct line on her father's side 
from Robert the Bruce. The fact would not, however, have deterred her from marrying a man, if she had been in love with him, before whom her parents would have thrown up their hands in horror. Women have not the class feeling of men. It is environment rather than instinct which sets their standard. A chorus girl who marries into the peerage can out-dowager any duchess, and a duke's daughter can be, and frequently is, more vulgar than any shop assistant. If Lena had hesitated at all over an intimacy with a man whom her father would have called an outsider, it would have been only to make sure that there was enough in common between them to make marriage possible. That settled, she would have thought no more about it. For Lena now very much wanted to be married. She no longer despised men at all. She respected them profoundly. She was not happy, and she longed for happiness. She knew herself well enough to realize that she could never be happy alone, and in spite of her brains, Lena at twenty-eight was, in her heart, old-fashioned enough to take it for granted that happiness for a woman lay only in a happy marriage. Having lived all her life in the country, where people do not talk about these things, she had never realized that the percentage of happy marriages among the population of Great Britain is probably something under point zero 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 one. Lena now wanted to be married very much indeed. She nearly had been married two years ago. What Lena had then considered the first and latterly the only love affair of her life had then dragged to an ignominious close. It had been with a man of whom her father heartily approved, a solid young landowner in a neighbouring county of impeccable parentage and equally impeccable reputation. Indeed, the only trifling blot on his perfection was the fact that mentally he resembled one of his own prize bulls, except that the landowner could hardly recognise the significance of a piece of red rag when he saw it. But that, of course, did not worry General Macleodlaw, and even Lena was able to keep her eyes shut to it. For even the blot had a silver margin. The young man was as solid as one of his own bulls, too. For the first time in her life, Lena found herself able to lean on someone, morally at any rate, if perhaps not spiritually, and she found the process singularly restful. She had fancied herself very much in love with this rock of gentility. When she was away from him, she invested him with all sorts of qualities which secretly, though she refused to admit the doubt, she was not at all sure that he possessed. She also put into his mouth certain passionate speeches, which she did quite well know that he would never utter. He would, in fact, have gone as deep a red as one of his own Devon cows at the very thought of speech at all on such topics, topics that are obviously undiscussable at all until one is decently married, and probably not to be discussed even then, only performed. When she was with him, it surprised her to find herself at times yawning with boredom. His attitude towards her was completely correct. He was kind, if a little obtuse, and most respectful. Lena wished he would not always be quite so respectful. A woman in love, even a young woman, does not want respect. She wants something a good deal warmer. And, if she does not get it, she will descend from the pedestal on which she has been unwillingly placed and astonish her worshipper with a totally irrational fit of hysterics. Slowly, Lena realized that a pillar of any sort, even of respect, though it may be solid, can be incredibly dull. Finding that she had mistaken leaning for love, she allowed the affair to fizzle out. Matters had not even reached the point of a formal engagement, for the pillar was a slow mover. He went back to his pigs and his apple trees, and Lena shed a great number of tears into her pillow, not for what had been, but for what had not. Lena was no Samson. Within a couple of months, the pillar 
quite unshattered, had announced his engagement to another, and plainly a more determined girl. And Lena had resigned herself to a perpetual spinsterhood. During the last two years, nothing had happened to shake her resignation. It was actually ten days before Lena saw Johnny Aysgarth again. The day was Sunday, and of the kind that only early April can produce. Lena, having left the observer to her parents indoors, had taken the Sunday Times out onto the flagged terrace and settled herself in a deck chair in the sun. Unfortunately, a part of the terrace was under observation from the drive, and though General MacLaidlaw had talked for years of running a hedge of Lonicera Nitaida across the vulnerable gap, nothing had ever been done about it. Lena looked up from James Agate's column to find herself surrounded by Frasers. The Frasers were very gay, very modern, very jolly. Everyone always said, and we must have the Frasers, of course. They make anything go. Lena found them unbearable. Get your hat on, my dear, Mrs. Fraser said gaily. We've come to drag you to church. Oh, said Lena, jumping up, I didn't see you coming. We wanted to go to the front door, giggled the eldest Miss Fraser, but Johnny saw you out here and insisted on coming round. Johnny, Lena echoed stupidly. Among the Frasers, she now saw Johnny Aysgarth, twinkling at her confusion. Lena blushed and hated everyone. Her mind groped with difficulty from James Agate, through Johnny's unbearably knowledgeable smile, to Mrs. Fraser. Church, she said, and felt that her conversation lacked sparkle. Place where they pray, dear explained the youngest, Miss Fraser, succinctly. You must have heard of it, where they park the parson. Nobody could say that the Fraser's conversation lacked sparkle. Hush, dear, smiled Mrs. Fraser mechanically. And then to Lena, Yes, really, Lena, the girls absolutely insist on your coming with us. But... I wasn't thinking about going to church this morning, Lena stammered. Then think about it now, said the middle Miss Fraser. You've got to come, so you may as well make up your mind to it. Johnny Aysgarth said nothing. He just stood there and grinned at her, but his grin was eloquent. Every line of his face told Lena that she was going to join the party and that he knew she was going to join the party. And she was going to join the party simply because he wished her to do so. Lena tried to speak calmly. In any case, I couldn't go to church in this frock. Against her will, she caught Johnny's eye. It was openly derisive. Lena's flush deepened. Certainly the implication contained in her banality that her creator could bear to be worshipped by Miss MacLaidlaw only in her best frock, hardly did credit to one who, out of twenty-four persons, had been the only one worth talking to. "'Then change,' said the middle Miss Fraser crisply, "'and buck up about it,' added her younger sister. Mrs. Fraser sank into the deck chair. Lena went upstairs in a fury. She knew quite well who was responsible for this preposterous invasion. The girls absolutely insisted, did they? Exceedingly likely. And what right had anyone to insist it was insufferable? Besides, everyone would see her there, sitting next to Johnny Aysgarth. Probably he would try to hold her hand during the sermon or something equally impossible, and everyone would know why she was there, and there would be talk, and people would say the most ridiculous things. But what made her most angry of all, as she tore off her frock, was the fact that she simply had not had the strength of mind to refuse. "'My dear, where are you going?' asked her mother with simple wonder, encountered on the stairs five minutes later. 
Lena held out her prayer book as if it had been a snake. To church, she said bitterly. What, all alone? No, with the Frasers. The Frasers? But I thought you didn't like them. I loathe them, replied Lena with conviction. Well, thank you, dearest, at any rate. It was quite time one of us went, said her parent. Life in the country has its obligations. Lena walked the half-mile along the dusty road between Johnny and Mrs. Fraser in angry silence. She refused to be appeased even by the precocity of the hedges and allowed her neighbours to exchange comments on them over her head. Johnny hardly spoke to her at all. At the church door she felt his hand on her arm. She tried to shake it off, but it held her too fast. She found herself being detained while the Frasers filed inside. Then, to her unspeakable indignation, she was turned about and marched back along the path, Johnny's hand tightly gripping her elbow right under the eyes of certain other latecomers. "'Mr. Aysgarth!' she gasped. "'What in the world?' Johnny's eyes twinkled at her, just like those of a schoolboy who has brought off a successful prank. "'You didn't think we were really going to church, did you? "'We're going for a nice long country walk, "'on which you're going to apologise for being so infernally rude to me last week.' "'I'll do nothing of the sort,' exploded Lena. "'Please let go of my arm at once. "'You will, and I won't. "'Come along, Lena.' "'They went. "'Well, dear, who was at church?' Oh, I didn't go after all, Lena said, helping herself to horseradish sauce from the tray at her side. I went for a walk. With the Frasers? asked Mrs. McLaidlaw in surprise. No, with Johnny Aysgarth. He gave her a little thrill of excitement just to speak his name so casually. General McLaidlaw drew his bushy brows down over the bridge of his nose in an effort of memory. "'Johnny Aysgarth? That's Tom Aysgarth's youngest boy, isn't it? "'Pity he's turned out a rotter. Rough luck on Tom. "'Tom may have been a fool, but he was always as straight as a die. "'What's this, eh? Horseradish? "'Didn't know horseradish was in season now. "'Is it out of a bottle, eh?' asked the general suspiciously. "'Of course not, dear.' replied Mrs. McLaidlaw with placid untruth. The general helped himself and tasted a portion. Ah, this is the real stuff. Tell the difference at once. Can't stand things out of bottles. Never taste the same. Never, dear, agreed Mrs. McLaidlaw. Why do you say Johnny Aysgarth is a rotter, father? Lena asked quite calmly. "'Because he is a rotter. "'Turned out of some club for cheating at cards, wasn't he? "'Or ought to have been turned out. "'Something unpleasant, anyway. "'What's he doing down here?' "'He's staying at Penshay's. "'I shouldn't have thought Lord Middleham would have had him there "'if he'd ever been turned out of a club for cheating at cards.' "'Lena's heart was beating so fast that she could hardly swallow. "'Well... It might have been a woman. Something ugly, I'm sure. Good heavens, grumbled General McLaidlaw. Can't expect me to remember every detail about everybody, can you? Anyhow, it was something to do with a woman. Co-respondent or something. Or ought to have been co-respondent or something. It may have been hushed up, but... Uh, Méfie-toi said Lena, with a militant sparkle in her eye. Les oreilles domestiques d'écoute. Uh, hum, said the general, and subsided. He always subsided when his daughter addressed him in French. Lena had been at school in Paris, and the general had not. Lena did her best to go on with her lunch, just as if this was as ordinary a Sunday as all the Sundays of her life before. Johnny Aysgarth had explained everything. Lena saw now that she had misjudged him quite heartlessly. 
The details were, perhaps, not quite so clear still, but Johnny had made it perfectly plain. She had misjudged him. He'd clung to her so closely on the day of the picnic because never in his life before had he met a girl who had attracted him so much at first sight. That had been very interesting to hear. And it was not Blarney. Lena, sceptical, very sceptical at first, had gradually become sure that it was not Blarney. Then he had avoided her afterwards because he was so afraid he had offended her. He had been afraid, yes, afraid of her, really afraid. She had alarmed him. She was so poised, so confident, so sure of herself and her ability to handle men. She, Lena, had simply had to laugh. Johnny had apologised. He had explained he had begged for forgiveness, and Lena had forgiven him. For what had been rather glossed over, but nevertheless with some ceremony, Johnny had been forgiven. After that, the morning had become almost impossibly delightful. Lena was to meet him again that afternoon. He was to bring his car, and they were going for a long run, with tea at some charming little inn, wherever they found a charming little inn. There would, of course, be no difficulty in finding a charming little inn. It was that sort of day. At half-past two, Johnny rang through to say that he was terribly, terribly sorry, but his cousins had arranged something or other for the afternoon, and it would be quite impossible for him to take Lena out. She went upstairs, feeling that life held nothing more for her. She did not see Johnny again for a fortnight. By the end of that time, she would have gone to meet him along a mile of public road on her knees. Actually, they became engaged about two months later. So far as Lena was concerned, it was not a happy engagement. At first, she was almost unbalanced with happiness, that she, Lena MacLaidlaw, letterbox MacLaidlaw, could have fascinated a man so experienced, so witty, so good-looking, so accomplished, so everything a man ought to be as Johnny Aysgarth, seemed quite incredible. But she had fascinated him. He adored her. He told her so repeatedly, with a mischievous smile at her incredulity, and his kisses carried conviction— Never had Lena dreamt that kisses could be so convincing. Johnny kissed her till her jaw ached quite painfully. She was enraptured. All her life, Lena had felt the need of someone on a pedestal in front of her, to whom she could look up as infallible. Hitherto, her father had occupied this position with a brief deposition in favour of the headmistress of her first school, now Johnny was firmly installed on a bigger, brighter, and better pedestal than had ever been in use before. Everything Johnny did was right. To Lena's horrified joy, he treated her not at all respectfully, hardly even politely. She was clearly very much of a woman to him. It was Lena's first experience of being a woman. Johnny, she knew, was the first man who had found her exciting, and prim though she was, almost to prudishness, it had always disturbed her vanity, and something deeper than her vanity, that other women, far less intelligent than herself, and sometimes downright plain, should, to her knowledge, have received advances of a kind that she had never encountered. Now she was having them thrust upon her, and though there was layer upon layer of primness to be broken through before she could relish them, so that delight and repulsion were continually at war in her mind, she knew she would be very upset if they were to cease. Besides, if Johnny made them, they were right. So that though she repulsed the more obvious of them, she did so laughingly and lightly for all that she was sometimes very shocked indeed. 
she felt that Johnny would despise her for being shocked. But they did cease, spasmodically. After the first fortnight or so, Lena was sure that Johnny's ardour was cooling. He left the neighbourhood. He hardly wrote a line to her when he was away, and when he came back, as he did every now and then for two or three days at a time, he was seldom so hair-raisingly bold with her as he had been. Lena wept nightly into her pillow and tried to find the reason. Had she been too cold with him, had she been idiot enough not to have hidden that she was shocked and put him off, had she been too outspoken in their last little quarrel, she so often said things on impulse that she would have given her right hand afterwards to recall. Had she allowed that nervous irritation of hers to fly out with even less cause than usual? It did so often. Or had she, hopeless thought, simply ceased to attract him? She wondered desperately whether it would not be better the next time he really seemed to want her to give herself to him. She used the cant phrase in her thought, once and for all, marriage or no marriage. She wanted to, really. But it had been impressed on both the Miss McLaidlaws, with all a mother's earnestness, that once a man has got what he wants, he wants nothing more. And Lena could not bear to think that Johnny should want nothing more of her than that. So it seemed better not to risk it. Both General and Mrs. McLaidlaw seemed to think that Johnny wanted a good deal more of her. That was another trouble. The General voiced it with soldierly conciseness. Mrs. McLaidlaw was more inclined to hint it in solicitous questions, but her purport was just as plain as her husband's. Both Lena's parents had conceived the preposterous fear that what Johnny wanted really was not so much Lena herself as the fifty thousand pounds which would come to Lena, as, under their grandmother's will, another equal sum would come to Joyce on the death of their father. Lena became almost speechless with anger against her parents, but not so speechless that she was unable to say things which no daughter should even think. Undeterred, the general gave it as his flat and undemanded opinion that all the Aesgarth stock was rotten, that Johnny was as rotten as the rest, if not a bit rottener, and whether he was after her money or not. If Lena could not do better for herself than marry an Aesgarth, then she should preferably take the veil or whatever it is that women do take when they take anything. Lena stood up to her father, and brushed angrily aside her mother's insinuating questions, but they made her very miserable. Not, of course, that there could be anything in them. Whatever Johnny had been, and by his own boast he had been a bit of a rip, which Lena vaguely deplored and yet felt a little proud of, whatever Johnny might have been, he was not that sort. Lena knew that. She knew it. And yet... Why was he often so cold and uninterested with her nowadays? And then she would be sure that Johnny was beginning to see through her at last. She was not what he had thought her. She was dull for a man so used to the most accomplished and fascinating women. Dull, prim, silly, provincial. Johnny was beginning to see through her. Then she would cry. And having cried, she would set her teeth and say out loud, Well, anyhow, I'm not going to let any other woman get him, never. Then she would cry again. Then, two days later, Johnny would kiss her so hard and make love to her so entrancingly and teasingly try to do such terrifyingly improper things to her that she would forget for half a dozen hours all her trouble. The upshot was, of course, that Lena adored him so madly that not all the generals in the world, drawn up 
in a solid glittering phalanx between herself and the altar could have prevented Lena from getting to Johnny there. Lena admitted humbly to herself that she did not know men. It did not occur to her quite how well Johnny might know women. The spectre of housekeeping brooded over her. Lena, who invariably worried over her troubles in advance, was convinced that she would never make an efficient housekeeper. She would make Johnny uncomfortable. She would forget the blacking. She would omit to order the cream for the strawberries. There would never be enough of anything in the house. She vowed passionately that she would always look through Johnny's shirts when they came back from the laundry. Never should a stentorian bellow echo through her house that there was a blank button missing from some blank garment. But she knew there would be. Then she would fall to brooding again over Johnny's new coldness and ask herself for the millionth time whether he really did love her still after all or was just being chivalrous after giving his promise. And if so, whether any measures were not better tried, however desperate, and whether, when a girl has lost that, she really has lost all. Lena was a great trial to her family and her friends during her engagement. She was a great trial to herself, too. And in any case, Johnny must have loved her after all. He must have loved her because, just three months after their engagement in early September, he married her. In a passion of gratitude, Lena was formally bestowed on Johnny Aysgarth before God's altar by a resigned but still indignant General McLeadlaw. Chapter 2 Darling, Lena said tentatively, Surely it was a fifty-franc note you gave the waiter, not a hundred-franc one. Johnny grinned at her as he shoveled the change away into his trouser pocket. It was. We put one over on him there. Don't often catch a French waiter making that sort of mistake, do you? Let's get on before he realises. But you aren't going to keep it. Of course I'm going to keep it. Johnny said, in genuine surprise, and stood up. Lena picked up her gloves and bag and followed him. She was surprised, too, and bewildered. Surely it was downright dishonest to keep the extra fifty francs without saying anything. Yet Johnny seemed to think it only an excellent joke. She walked in silence beside him along the boulevard. She felt somehow hurt, as if Johnny had cheated her instead of an obscure waiter in the Café de la Paix. Because it was cheating, there was no getting away from it. Or wasn't it? Johnny would not conceivably cheat consciously, so evidently he did not consider it cheating at all, and yet... Her mind went back to that rather curious incident after lunch yesterday. They had sat on, talking for hours, as they often did still, although the honeymoon was now in its seventh and last week, and one by one the waiters had disappeared, till at last they had the room to themselves, as Johnny had marked by kissing her across the table. It was twenty minutes to four when at last she went to powder her nose, and certainly Johnny had not paid the bill then. When she came back, Johnny was still alone, but with his hat and gloves in his hand. He had risen at once, and they had gone downstairs. Just as they were going out, a waiter had come up to Johnny and said something. Lena was already halfway through the door, and she had not heard very distinctly, but she had thought he was asking Johnny if he had paid. Johnny answered something carelessly, and followed her outside, where they had stepped straight into a taxi by the curb. Lena had happened to look back just as the taxi was starting, and had seen the waiter looking through the glass door at them with a very odd expression, certainly of doubt, almost, one might have said, of suspicion. He had seemed to be trying to make up his mind, in the half-second at his disposal, whether to run out onto the pavement after them or not. It was ridiculous, of course, because Johnny must have paid while she was powdering her nose, but, 
the waiter's expression had been so strange that she asked Johnny herself in the taxi whether he had paid, and Johnny had said in some surprise that of course he had. She had thought no more about it. She told herself that it was ridiculous to think any more about it now. They were walking towards the Madeleine after their aperitif to lunch at Voisin. Johnny was finding amusement, as he always did, in the people who passed them. Darling, do look at what's coming towards us. No, this one with the fuzzy hair. What is he, do you think, an artist, or something escaped from a home? I mean, if he wants to wear a mauve tie with a scarlet shirt, I suppose that's all right, but do you think he ought to be allowed to wear purple socks, too? Shall I call a gendarme, darling? I really think we ought to give him in charge for assaulting our eyesight. Hello? Hasn't that girl's posterior slipped from its moorings? Shall we stop her and tell her? She'd probably be grateful. I'm sure it ought to be looped up again. You tell her, darling, it's a woman's job. Johnny, said Lena, please come back to the Café de la Paix with me and give that waiter those fifty francs back to please me. Johnny laughed and tucked her hand under his arm. You funny little thing. Aren't you delighted at having put one over on those thieves for a change? I am, I can tell you. They're simply out to rob us at every turn. It gives me a lot of pleasure to get our own back for once. But it, it's dishonest, darling, Lena said, really distressed. Dishonest, my hat. I've been robbed of a good deal more than fifty francs since we came here. That's a little back, on account. He looked down at her with the mischievous schoolboy smile that so peculiarly belonged to him. You mustn't be so punctilious, you infant. Besides, it makes me feel good. To cheat a waiter out of fifty francs? You funny little thing, said Johnny indulgently but Lena did not smile back. After lunch, Johnny took her to the best shoe shop in Paris and bought her the most expensive pair of mules in the place, decorated with absurd and delectable flame-coloured feathers. She had mentioned, just by chance, in their bedroom that morning that she really must get a pair of mules before they left Paris. She had forgotten all about the fifty francs before they left the shop. Johnny was wonderful. On the whole, Lena blissfully enjoyed her honeymoon. Johnny was perfect, attentive, affectionate, and patient. They did not have a single crossword, and they laughed and talked inordinately. For the first time in her life, Lena found herself able to talk without reserve, and she poured herself out in a flood of words which Johnny received with, at any rate apparently, close attention. Though from some of his irrelevances which occasionally followed, Lena was not quite sure whether he had altogether appreciated all the subtler points she had been trying to make. But the mere talking cleared her mind of a lot of lumber that had been accumulating for years. For the first week or two, she had tortured herself with doubt as to whether she would ever make a satisfactory wife at all. She was desperately anxious to find and to give complete fulfilment in marriage. But try as she might at first, she simply could not see what all the fuss was about. It all seemed to her, to say the least, remarkably overrated. With characteristic despair, she had decided within the first three days that she never would be satisfactory, that there was something lacking in her which would make her always useless as a wife. It never occurred to her that the conflicting emotions which possessed her might be something that she was sharing with every other bride that had ever been. Her case was unique. No one before 
could ever have experienced feelings so bewilderingly contradictory and so intense. Johnny was very kind to her and very gentle, and her adoration for him increased in ratio with the conviction of her own insufficiency. The knowledge that he must be finding her so inadequate, though he never even hinted as much, distressed her unbearably. When he was asleep, she lay and cried for hours by his side. Always she had supposed herself passionate. Now put to the test, it appeared that she was not. Worse, she could not even begin to understand what passion was. It became clear to her that she had not distinguished between mental and physical passion, taking it for granted that the presence of the one implied the possession of the other. As a wife, it was plain that she could never be a success. Previous experience reinforced this pessimism. She thought she realised now why she had never been approached in this way before. Other men had instinctively recognised her inadequacy. Only Johnny had been chivalrously mistaken. She tried to say something of all this to Johnny and to apologise for her shortcomings. But Johnny did not seem to understand what was worrying her. It was borne in upon her that Johnny could not be quite so perceptive, nor even quite so sensitive as she had imagined. The ideal lover should know the inside of his mistress's mind as well as he knows his own, for how otherwise can he anticipate her thoughts and fulfil her wishes in advance? Johnny either did not realise the immensity of the trouble that overshadowed them both, or else was inclined to laugh it away, which Lena could not bear. In the same way, she was secretly a good deal upset by Johnny's proficiency in his love-making. She told herself, and she had told Johnny too, that it did not matter to her in the least what he had done before he met her, but it did matter. She found herself jealous, sometimes bitterly jealous, of all the women Johnny had loved before he loved her. I'm being ridiculous, she told herself, with tears in her eyes. It's a fatal mistake to be proprietary. I won't be proprietary. But she was proprietary. She felt proprietary. Johnny was hers now as she was his, and she wished fervently that he could have come to her clean, as she had to him. And yet all the time she could not help thinking how wonderful it was of him to have had so much success and experience. Johnny thought so too. On the whole, however, Lena enjoyed her honeymoon. Of one thing it was impossible to accuse Johnny, and that was niggardliness. He spent with an unconscious prodigality that left Lena quite aghast. 